Good afternoon and hello from Washington, D.C. I'm Kim Churches, CEO of AAUW. We are so delighted you are joining us today about the launch of our new research report called Factory Flaw regarding attrition uh, and uh, what's happening with women in manufacturing today and how we can ensure women can be a part of this very, very critically important industry uh, to the U.S. economy and the global economy. And as we get started, today really we'll be talking a lot about why this research project is so key. Many of you have probably been following uh, the Biden-Harris administration and their uh, uh, hope to really stimulate U.S. manufacturing in the coming months and years as part of their one of their key uh, priorities in the administration. And why that's important too is right now U.S. manufacturing accounts for 2.3 trillion dollars in our economy, but women only make up about one out of every three manufacturing jobs. And so we'll talk today um, quite a bit about what our independent research has found in this and where those opportunities are to make enable Rosie the Riveter 2.0 to really thrive and succeed in this critically important industry. Um, I'm delighted today, before I turn it over to my colleagues, to introduce you to Ryan Kish, who is Vice President and Treasurer of the Arconic Foundation. And I'm particularly grateful to the Arconic Foundation for their longstanding support of AUW's work and our mission, and particularly for their support of this independent research report today. Um, I know how much uh, Ryan and his team at Arconic really value uh, women and people of color in the industry, and so we're uh, all the more grateful to Ryan for his support uh, today and the launch of our new research report. So I, with that, I will turn it over to Ryan for a few words. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. As Kim said, I'm Ryan Kish, the Vice President and Treasurer of Arconic Foundation. Arconic Corporation is a global aluminum manufacturing company, primarily serving the automotive, aerospace, and commercial building markets. Arconic Foundation is our charitable organization that conducts grant making in our communities all around the world uh, to advance STEM education, environmental sustainability, and social equity. And as, as Kim mentioned, Arconic Foundation is a longtime partner of AAUW, and we were thrilled to, to support this research project. Uh, understanding the issues that affect attrition and retention of women in the manufacturing industry is really the key for us to overcome those issues and to move past them. Um, so we are very interested to see um, the researchers report and their findings and look forward to, to reviewing those ourselves. Um, and with that, I simply want to say thank you to AAUW, to the researchers, and to all of you for being here um, to hear about these findings and to share those findings with your networks. So thank you. Ryan, thank you again so much. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Nielsen, who's going to lead us through our discussion today. Thanks, Kim. And a big thank you to Ryan for the generous support from the Arconic Foundation to conduct this important independent research. So many thanks. Uh, let's dive into the presentation. Uh, as Kim said, my name is Kate Nielsen. I'm AUW Senior Director of Public Policy Research and Legal Advocacy. I have the privilege of working with our research team on this report and the policy team on turning the findings into tangible actions for employers and policymakers. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren Hamaser, who in conjunction with Melissa Mahoney authored this report. Lauren's going to give us an overview of the findings, and then I'm going to have a discussion with Vera Newton, who worked in manufacturing for over 30 years, about what these findings look like in the real world, and we'll delve into some of the recommendations for employers and policymakers alike, and then take your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren. So we started this research with kind of four key questions. So one, we just needed to get a grip on what was going on with women in manufacturing. Two, we wanted to know if women were indeed more likely to leave their manufacturing jobs uh, than men or than women in other industries. Three, if the answer to that question was yes, we wanted to know why. And then obviously this leads to point four, we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't want to try to figure out how to encourage women to stay. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, what is the status of women in manufacturing? So as we all know, manufacturing has been in decline, and particularly since uh, between January of 2000 and January of 2020, there's a 26% decline in manufacturing jobs, but that fell more on women than on men. So 31% 30, of women in the industry lost their jobs in that period compared to 23% of men. 
But the industry has rebounded a bit since 2010, and so that does represent some opportunity for women. Um, as Kim Church has mentioned, women only make up one in every three employees in manufacturing. And they work in a variety of subsectors, but they are overemployed in non-durable goods, which is typically lower paying than durable goods. So 35% of um, employees in durable, non-durable goods are women, and that pays below average wages. So, you know, manufacturing is a field where women could stand to make a good wage, but not if they're, you know, concentrated in this lower paying subsector. Another thing we found is that there's been a growing importance of a college education in manufacturing. So between 2003 and 2019, women with just a high school diploma but no college went through a 29% decline in jobs. And women without a high school diploma went through a 42% decline. So that's pretty serious, and that's a greater decline than the industry as a whole. But women with a college diploma during that same period experienced a 41% increase in employment. And women with advanced degrees experienced a 95% increase. So the industry is moving toward more highly educated roles, and women could really stand to benefit from this. Another interesting thing we found was the importance of union membership. Um, you know, this is kind of a double-edged sword. So unionized women lost 40% of their jobs in between 2003 and 2019. And that's really bad because unions can actually help close the wage gap between men and women. So unionized women make 94% of what unionized men earn, which is not bad and much better than the wage gap as a whole. And that's compared to only 78% of an earnings ratio for ununionized women. And then another interesting thing we found is represented in this table, and that's that there is significant disparities by race in manufacturing. White women consistently earned more on average than black or Hispanic women. And Asian women on average earned more, likely because they have higher education. Women, Asian women in manufacturing have, um, are more likely to have a college or advanced degree. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this was our next question is, are women in manufacturing more likely to leave their jobs? And the answer to both of these points on the slide is yes. Women are more likely than men in manufacturing to leave their jobs, and they're more likely than women in other fields on average to leave their jobs. And that holds true even when we controlled for age, race, marital status, parental status, union membership, region of the country, local economic activity. And so that tells us that there's something going on in this industry that makes it a difficult environment for women. Next slide, please. So we conducted a survey of women in manufacturing, and we found that there were a few key reasons that caused women to leave. So the first one, perhaps not surprising in a male-dominated work environment, was sexual harassment. So in our analysis of industry transitions using Census Bureau micro, macro data, women who are less likely to experience sexual harassment at work are less likely to leave for jobs in other industries. So it's good in a way because it tells us that if we can control the sexual harassment problem, we can keep women in manufacturing. But as you can see from this graph from our survey data, there is really an alarming incidence of sexual harassment. So as you can see, you know, 82.7% of women who work in manufacturing have been subjected to unwanted touching, kissing, or other physical advances, which is just wild for a workplace. And the things that women reported were really horrifying. Um, one woman described how a male coworker wrapped his hands around her neck from behind when she was at work. Others just reported the frequency of harassment. They said it happens to them every single day. Um, but this is also complicated because the relationship between experiencing harassment at work and leaving for a comparable job in the manufacturing industry is actually quite weak. And that tells us that this could be because harassment, women know that harassment is really an industry-wide problem. It's not just isolated to one employer. And so women don't expect that by leaving their jobs, they're going to find it any better anywhere else. 
And again, women's comments kind of bore that out. One of them wrote, you know, it's male oriented. And basically, if you're a woman, expect comments and get over it. And a lot of them put the onus on women to stick up for each other rather than for men to stop harassing. So sexual harassment seems like it could be a big issue. Another is something that we're calling a glass maze, and that's not our term. It's um, another researcher who invented it, but it represents the notion that women are struggling for equal pay and promotions at all steps on the work ladder. So the greater the share of women managers in a sub-industry, the less likely that women are to leave their jobs. That's good. But in our survey, almost a third of women said they felt that men received more promotions than they did in an a not equal manner based on their experience. And when you combine unequal pay and unequal promotions into one variable, 30% of the difference in whether a woman would accept a job at another employer could be attributed to whether she felt that men were receiving unequal pay and promotions. And again, in their comments, women talked about, um, you know, just beg to be treated equally. They say, you know, treat me equally, whether I'm doing something wrong or right. Another reported that, you know, they give us easier jobs because they silently believe we aren't as capable and that it's humiliating. So that could be a big factor. Another is the effect of male-dominated workplaces. And we think that this could have a compounding effect, but interestingly, it doesn't have an effect on its own. And that could mean one of two things. One, women could have accepted that manufacturing is just a male-dominated industry. So one woman wrote, you know, as a woman, it slowly becomes clear that there are still remnants of a good old boys club in manufacturing. Okay, so she doesn't really expect it's going to change. But I think another thing is that in some cases, men can be great supervisors and great bosses. One woman reported that in a previous job at a steel manufacturer, she didn't even realize that she was the only woman in her department because she had a really great support team and they were all men. But then as those men cycled out and new ones came in, she said that she started getting treated like an assistant, and that made her feel pretty dispirited. Finally, I want to point to the effect of parental status and paid family leave. This is really interesting. Being a parent reduced the likelihood that a woman would leave her job in manufacturing, perhaps suggesting that childcare responsibilities constrain women's decisions and options to change jobs. So if you already have a kid or two kids, you might feel less secure in going out for a job search and trying to find another job, whereas men, it actually makes them more likely to change jobs. But dissatisfaction with the amount of paid family leave is a key reason that all women, even women who are not mothers, leave manufacturing jobs for jobs at other employers. So 69.2% of women that we surveyed were dissatisfied with the amount of paid family leave. And the fact that this isn't just about mothers who are saying this tells us that paid family leave is important for all women. It's important to be able to take care of family members who are not just children. And one woman even commented, you know, my husband gets all this sick leave and he was employed at the same employer, but had a different family leave policy. He had sick leave and family leave and he was able to take care of his aging mother. And she was worried that if something similar happened to her, she wouldn't be able to take the time off. Women were also dissatisfied with not receiving full pay when they were on leave. Um, so it wasn't just about the duration, but it was about getting half pay or, you know, a short term. So again, I just want to emphasize that with women in manufacturing, it's important that we think about them not just as mothers, but as carers for elders, partners, siblings, and so on. So those were kind of our key reasons why we found that women leave the manufacturing industry. And Kate, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some policy, um, you know, lowercase p policy for employers and um, in terms of legislation for how we can help women stay in the industry given these findings. Wonderful. Thanks, Lauren. Really appreciate your presentation now and all the hard work that you put into this report. I think some really critical um, and interesting findings that we can build upon. Um, and I will cover some of the, the policies that um, we recommend folks work on as a wrap up. But in the meantime, I want to bring in Vera Newton to this conversation to sort of flesh out some of these findings and talk about her experiences in this field. Um, to build upon the statistics and findings that Lauren talked about and some of the stories that she brought to light. 
Um, I think Vera has, um, for good or bad, a lot that she can add to this conversation from her own experiences. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask Vera to join the conversation and I'll just start with some context setting and ask you to, Vera, tell a little bit about your personal story and where your career started and how you ended up in manufacturing. Oh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I started out in organized labor with the phone company, CWA, back in the early 70s. Uh, transferred to Houston, uh, returned home after two years, then got into banking. And banking, although you was very much promoted into a assistant vice president position within banking, but banking didn't pay when you were becoming a single parent with a child going into high school. So I took a job into manufacturing at one of the leading big three manufacturers in uh, the area and starting out on the assembly line. So that's how my career started in manufacturing, uh, becoming a single mother and I needed to pay, I needed to keep my household together. So that's how I started out. Thanks, Farah. Um, really, really interesting to see the transition yeah. away from the financial industry, which I think yeah. a lot of people think of as lucrative, um, <laughs> but manufacturing was ultimately much more so for you. Um, so, But clearly a good salary was important, but you also made some sacrifices for this job. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, just as you mentioned though, working, I, I'll, I'll just say in my first two weeks, <laughs> after I got my first paycheck in organized manufacturing, uh, that paycheck was twice of what I made as an assistant vice president in banking on that mm. two in that first week, that first two week paycheck. But let me also say that it was also union. It was a union pay job versus it was a non-union pay job versus in banking, I was being paid um, less than what maybe that person next to me was being paid, mm -hmm. who maybe I had trained on the job. So that was a difference too, not knowing what your coworkers were being paid. Hmm. Um, can, you, can you just paint the picture? Because when we first chatted, um, yes. I was so struck by this. What did what's your first two weeks on the job look like for you? And, and specifically your first day? Oh, I love this. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. You got me. Um, I, I When they called me on Thursday and told me to report on Monday at 4.30 in the afternoon, I asked what was I, what was my, uh, what was I supposed to wear, to wear? And they told me dress casual. So casual for me coming out of five years in banking was I walked in that first day on the manufacturing floor with some uh, patent leather Papagallo shoes. I had a matching green silk blouse that matched the leaves on the Papagallo shoes. I had on some Liz Claiborne jeans. I also had just got my hair uh, 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 done over the weekend, so it was curled down to my shoulders. And I also had like about $5 worth of makeup on, eyeshadow, mascara uh, on my eyes, and I also was wearing my uh, Chanel Number no. 5 perfume. So they put me right at the front of the line and I was doing what they called a radiator field job with an apron around my waist. Oh, I'm sorry, and I had pantyhose on and this was June the 12th. Um, so they put me in front of this big giant fan that was blowing the wind, you know, because it was so hot inside the factory. Uh, my radiator field job, uh, as, it, as the job came toward me, I was to take the radiator cap off I was to attach this radiator hose onto the cap of the radiator, walk around to the side, do three wire, attach three wires, come back to the front, take the radiator uh, hose off, and I put in what they called a dog turd, which was a compressed ball of sawdust that went into the radiator and put the cap back on. As the hose went back, uh, uh, retracted back up, it drips of radiator fluid dripped on my beautiful Papagallo shoes. So by the end of the night, the shoes had uh, separated from the top and the bottom of the soles to where my feet were so swollen being on my feet for 10 hours, I could not lift my foot up without the, the shoes opening up like a mouth. You can see all 10 toes 
on my shoes. My hair was blowed straight back and drips of uh, perspiration was dripping down from my forehead until to my chin. You could see the, the, the mascara where I was wiping my eyes with the sweat out of my eyes and I had like black rings around my eyes. Hair was blowed straight back. I looked like the bride of Frankenstein when she came down from the ceiling. My hair was blowed straight back. So the next day I came in prepared with the right attire, but I had a gym bag with soap and baby powder and stuff that I could go down to one of the women's restroom and take a shower in their shower and come back on the line. For the two weeks, I did that job, but while in the restrooms, I would put my foot on the handle of the, the commode and cry and as it flushed so no one could hear me crying because I knew I made a mistake of leaving banking. But at the end of two weeks, I was working that job. I was really struggling. And a gentleman came over to me and he pushed this piece of paper in my shoulder and I caught it before it fell on the floor and I opened it up and it was my first paycheck. When I saw that first paycheck, I said to myself, sugar, honey, iced tea, I can do this job. And I stopped crying. No more tears. Oh, it takes a lot of courage to do what you did and perseverance. Uh, yeah, it did. It and did. I'm, I'm glad the paycheck um, made it a little easier. <laughs> Um, but no doubt you, you made a lot of sacrifices for the job and absolutely one of absolutely. As Lauren was just talking about one of the reports, major findings was around sexual harassment and yes. how pervasive it is. Um, yes, and yes. unfortunately I think that that was something that you saw a lot of. So I'm wondering if you can speak to its prevalence in the manufacturing industry. It was, it was. And it, during the time I came in the late eighties, early nineties, you, even though the, there were sexual harassment uh, laws and, and um, they were put in place, but that was pretty much ignored when you got on the factory floor because men looked at it that you were taking the position of a man that could take care of his family, but they didn't look at it the fact that I'm a single mother that I needed to take care of my family. So with that being said, a lot of times they would just kind of turn their head when you saw someone bump against them or you would see an example. We had one young lady that was being trained on doing this particular job, a radiator, I mean, it was an engine job. And the, the trainer who was the team leader on that area, instead of standing on the other opposite side of the, the, the job station, showing her what to do, he chose to shadow her and was leaning as she leaned forward pointing out as she was trying to do what she was supposed to do on her job. But his body was touching the backside of her. And this young lady was so afraid to say anything because of her being less than 90 days, she was crying. And what, what they did, other people around them, around her, they sent for the women's committee representative, which I was one of the representatives. So the two of us came over and observed what was going on. And we pulled him off the job and we put him in the position where we told him if he did not stop, because we, we gave him a chance, being a union sister and brother, we gave him a chance. If he did not stop, we would report him and have him disciplined or fired, depending upon his work record, if he did not leave that young lady alone. She was actually crying because she was scared to say anything, but he was actually touching her as he bent over and was shadowing her as she did the job. Mm. Such a problem. I'm yeah, sorry it that was you really, witnessed really. experience that. And, and to make that matters worse, a lot of people around would see things going on, but they were afraid to say anything to, be, to jeopardize, to not jeopardize their job. Because of the pay and because of what was going on, they wouldn't say anything. And a lot of times they would not say anything because that would they would be afraid of ret uh, retaliation with, from the supervisor or from other work people around them. A lot of times I, I myself have seen things that went on and reported it. <laughs> and I've gone home with little holes of, uh, of, of little socket holes where they would throw sockets at the back of my shirt because oh. they were mad because I said something about what was going on and they didn't like it. That, they looked at that was part of their fun on the job. Man, <laughs> one of the, oh yeah, one of yeah. another finding. Matter. Yeah, I've been through a lot. 
Um, another finding of the report was that there's a real lack of um, parental supports and flexibility in paid leave. And I think that these harm everyone, but women in particular. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what your experience with these issues was. Absolutely. I, I, unfortunately, in my family life, I had to, uh, to take on custody of two nieces and a nephew for one for two years and uh, the others for eight years. And with that being said, part of that custody, uh, I had to have them in uh, therapy. They had to go to therapy. And I asked for FMLA. And having FMLA, I wanted to take the uh, option of being able to take them to therapy appointments, the therapist appointments, uh, once a week. And I was willing to accept that and not being paid for that. But I was denied five times to get that. Even going through the union bargainers to ask for that, I was told I didn't have enough time, that I couldn't do this, and they, they couldn't uh, afford to take me off my, my job in order to do that. And I was denied five times for that. But when November came or October came up every year, men in the area could get time off to go deer hunting. And that would just, I mean, I, and even if I, I pointed that out, that wasn't enough to give me the FMLA to take these children to therapy, but yet these gentlemen could get time off for deer hunting. So yeah, there was a big disparity between men and women. Or, or what about in the women in the plant? when they had children that were breastfeeding, they couldn't go and take time off to go over to a, a, breast, a breastfeeding area, nor did they have that available to them in the breastfeeding area so that they could you know, take the milk out and hold the milk for their children. That was an issue that, that's still being uh, debated on today. It's amazing that uh, the stories that you have from your 30 year career, I think sort of, yes remain remain true and the the beat the beat goes on oh yeah um i want to turn to a, a different part of the report and and a snippet from it that i'm going to read and um, ask for your take on it um our research found that for white women the availability of employee resource groups helped to reduce reduce turnover but for women of color this was not necessarily the case uh, these findings indicate that women of color do not gain the same sense of support from women's resource groups that white women do, likely because the groups, like the industry itself, are heavily white and therefore do not attend to women of color's intersectional identities. So I know you've been involved with a lot of organizing. You've been with CLU, which uh, is the Coalition of Labor Union Women, yeah. and NAACP. Um, you've been a strong union member. Um, were you involved in any employee resource groups um, and were they helpful to you or do you have recommendations on how they could be more helpful to all workers, but particularly women of color? Um, yes, I'm gonna say yes. I felt a lot of support from the constituency groups that I've been a member of and it's helped me a lot. And I have to say that because of training that I've received through these constituency groups, I was able to ask and demand more uh, visibility within my particular union. Now, in my union, I am very proud to say that we have a senior vice president who's a, a Latino sister and she is dynamic. And we also now have a the first time African-American vice president of one of our regions that's just recently received that position. And I'm very proud of that. But with that being said, it's taken a long time for us to reach that plateau. And that's what the issue is. And I, and I have to say that even in my uh, career, working in my location, I was one of a very few women that were put in union positions, uh, leadership positions in my, inside my facility. Very few. And even on our executive board, we had uh, no women of color on our executive board. So that, that was an issue. Now we do have women of color and I'm very proud of that. Very proud of this, of the women that are now taking the positions, but it has been a struggle. But I have to say that being part of the constituency group gave me more clarity, gave me more training, how to, to ask and how to demand and how to work toward to get more leadership roles within my, my existing union. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I also know that you were responsible for a lot of the onboarding and training um, of other folks who, who joined the industry um, and worked with you. So I'm just wondering if you have any stories or lessons learned from the sexual harassment uh, trainings and other onboarding that you conducted. Uh, yes, uh, as my, with my last 17 years within my particular uh, big three manufacturer, I was put in charge of uh, training and development for any new hire that came into my particular location. And also with that training and development that included sexual harassment, ongoing safety training that I was part of developing and training the people inside the plant and new hires. With the new hires, it was a, a bit of an issue where a lot of the men did not like having women to tell them what to do. That was a big issue that I had with other people coming in from the outside and people within my facility did not like having a woman tell them what to do or what they could not do. And that that became an issue. Then uh, I had to learn to stand up. I had to uh, be able to take uh, ugly remarks and I had to learn to give them back in order to keep that position and let them know that you couldn't be bullied. Yeah, there, uh, there were women that even in the new hard status that came in into manufacturing, they felt that they couldn't stay. And uh, there were some that quit within the first two weeks because they did not realize what they had to do or they did not realize the hours that they had. They didn't know that the, they did not have the flexibility of the work hours. And some of these young women were single parents also. And they could not work the hours that they had to have being in a union environment, you were subjected to the hours that you hired in. They had to give you those hours, which was available, uh, the position that was open for them. And a lot of them did quit within the two years. Uh, training, I uh, had sexual harassment training that I had to give every new person that came into the plan had to get at least two to four hours of sexual harassment training that went on their record. And with, uh, with that being said, that was very important because there were issues where we had it had come back to me where some of these people, especially young people, didn't realize what they could say and what they couldn't say. And with me having it on their records to show that they did receive that training, that unfortunately that was held against them, the fact that you knew that this is what you could or could not do. So therefore that was brought up, you know, that was part of the training that I had to give the new people. And that was also an issue with the ones who had senior, had senior uh, times within the plant. They couldn't get over the fact that they couldn't do some of these things as far as, far as sexual harassment. They felt like, well, I mean, I've done it all the time. Why can't I continue to do it? Why, 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 you know, that's what you understood that you come into this factory. You know, you had to deal with it. You had to suck it up, buttercup. And, you know, that's the way they looked at it. And they didn't realize that they couldn't do that anymore. And unfortunately, I had to see some with seniority of 31, 35 years were fired because of the fact that they could no longer speak or talk or touch mm -hmm. as they've done in the past. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Vera. And uh, yeah. you've brought to life so many of the the elements that we found through our research um, found to be to be true and problematic um, and in need of addressing. Um, and oh, but can I say please. one more thing? Yes. Okay, I want to say also that uh, over the years too, I have seen an increase with women in the apprenticeship program. Oh, that's great. That's another. That's another thing that uh, back when I came in, there were very few women in the apprenticeship program. And I am so pleased to see that those numbers are increasing, although they're still few compared to the men and with African-American women inside the apprenticeship program. But the numbers are starting to increase. And unfortunately, that was brought about because of ongoing lawsuits within manufacturing that had to push that. And that's another reason why women came into manufacturing because of lawsuits had been pushed. We even had where women were denied uh, uh, entry or applications or denied jobs because they didn't weigh enough. I think the minimum wages was 150 pounds, but yet men were hired that weighed less than 150 pounds 
into these jobs, into manufacturing. So that, that was an issue, but it took lawsuits in order for women and women of color to be, to be put into these positions. And I'm, and I'm very happy to say that within my union, these issues have been addressed and they're, they're slowly going away. Now there are pockets, I can say there are pockets inside of local manufacturing plants that, that probably still deal with that, but women are standing up compared to what was years ago where they were afraid to stand up. Well, um, it just goes to show how important it is yeah. to have both women like you, but also strong advocates um, at all yeah. different levels, um, pushing for change and then forcing yeah. and implementing that change. Um, so I want to pause here for just a minute. And first, thank you, Vera, for sharing thank your you. story. Um, and I'd like to just um, do a sort of summary of what we've heard from Vera and what we found in our report for our recommendations um, on changes to policy and practice. Um, and then we will turn to questions from there. Uh, so if we can just get the last slide up, that would be great. Um, and I'll just talk for a minute about some of our, our final findings on what folks can do um, and push for. Um, and the first that I want to touch on um, that Vera spoke so eloquently about is the prevalence of sexual harassment. So this really needs to be addressed both by employers and by policymakers to really curb it and make sure that this is not something that workers have to deal with. Um, and the report suggests a bunch of different ways to get at this. Some is through surveying folks, through having good practices and procedures in place, strong protections. Um, and making sure that the trainings are taken seriously and, and respected. Um, beyond that, ensuring equity and pay and promotions to make sure to examine where people are in their pay and make sure everyone's being paid equally. Um, I think it, it's, it's good for morale, it's good for retention, uh, it's very important for making sure um, that everyone is treated the same, treated equally. Uh, Vera also touched on uh, paid family leave. This is absolutely critical and not just for women. Everyone needs to be able to access leave to take care of their families. Um, so this can be addressed both through employers responding directly, but also some really strong policy proposals that would require it. Additionally, supporting access to higher education um, to make sure that folks are able to get into and excel at the positions that they're interested in um, and that are high paying. Um, and then finally, as we touched on just at the end, making sure that employee resource groups really respond to what workers need and meet them where they are um, so that they are supported and um, fundamentally feel that they are valued in their workplace um, and are getting the resources that they need to be able to excel. Um, so the, that is sort of a summary of our findings and what we recommend. Um, as, as employers think about how to tackle this, as individuals think about how to be good advocates, and as workers think about what they need. So with that, I'm going to conclude for a moment um, and open up the Q&A to any questions that folks have about the report or to Vera about her experience. Um, one strand of questions that I'm seeing coming in that I'm not sure if Vera can speak to or not, but I'll open it to you. Um, is about contrasting your experience um, in the banking industry to that in manufacturing and whether um, you experience sexual harassment and um, lack of paid leave and flexible work hours in the banking industry as well, or if it was um, worse within manufacturing. Uh, I must say that in banking, I put in 50 to 60 hours a week. I was exhausted. I would come in on Saturdays in order to catch up because of the lack of uh, people in the department that I was over. I was over customer service and they did not want to hire anyone. So therefore I had to kind of catch up work and I was exhausted. And that was another reason why I left uh, banking. And, but let me say, my experience at banking also gave me uh, more of a, uh, an advantage when I got into organized labor, I was put in charge of what we call the, the funds that, that govern um, where I would pay uh, overtime or I would pay and buy um, products for the plant. 
And that, that was part of my job that I did where I made these purchases. It was like a fund, training funds. I was in, over the training funds and training funds would buy promotional items for the plant. And because of my banking background, they put me over that. And I handled that very well for like 10 years. So yeah, that did help as far as harassment. It was worse in banking because I had no, I had nothing to go back to, to, for protection. It was worse, in my opinion, in banking. It was worse. Now, once I got into manufacturing, it was bad in manufacturing in the beginning, but as, as years progressed and more contracts came up and more people were, or women were outspoken, those things uh, and the lawsuits, and the lawsuits in manufacturing, kind of filtered that away a little bit. But like I said, there are still pockets within manufacturing that some people probably get away with. But yes, it was worse than banking. Thank you for answering that. Um, I'm sorry that was, well, I don't know if I'm sorry that was your answer. I'm sorry it's a problem anywhere. Um, yeah, it is. But it's I think it, it goes to show that um, these, that while there are problems that are unique, um, or experiences of problems that are unique to different industries. Uh, yeah. It takes strong concerted legislation to tackle this in the employment um, workforce generally, um, because these are so prolific across industries. Yeah. Um, and I see a couple clarifying questions um, that Vera worked uh, for one of the, the big three um, car manufacturers. Um, and then let's see what other questions we have. Yes, I see a flag about accommodations for pregnant nursing mothers. Absolutely, um, very important thing to work on. Um, and a, a good step on this, if you're legislatively inclined, um, is to focus on the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which is something that AUW strongly advocates for. Um, it's very important um, to, to ensure that it's passed. Um, let's see. Um, so I see questions about reporting to HR, um, which I think is very important, but um, Vera, do you, do you have anything that you'd like to weigh in on there in terms of whether that was uh, friendly or conducive to helping solve your problems? I would say it was not as friendly as you think it would have been. Uh, there was a process that you had to go through. When, when, when we did the training for sexual harassment, uh, first of all, you had to be the one to stand up and say no, all right? And then you had to go to your, your committee person. Then you had to go to your, your, uh, your, your supervisor. Well, once the supervisor knows that that's going on, he's obligated. And then you could take it to uh, HR because he had to, to discipline that person that was doing the harassment. And if that wasn't taken care of, then it would go to HR. And then once it got to HR, then it, it started a process of, uh, of uh, discipline actions. But in the beginning, a lot of times women would go directly to HR and it was pretty much thrown back to the union to handle that. But because of the, the again, the lawsuit that came about, then there was a constructive measure of how we, that was handled. It was constructive steps that had to follow that made it easier to report harassment within the workplace. And it got better, yes. Thank you. I also, I think in general, there is real fear um, around retaliation um, yes. and yes. folks do not always feel that it, it's safe. And we see that not only with reporting harassment, but also when it comes to pay inequality and trying to find out if you're paid fairly. Um, I think people are very nervous to ask the questions and try and dig a little bit to get that information, which is again why we of course need employers who are good actors, um, but we also need legislation that mandates this um, and provides backstops. So everyone's operating from a level and equal playing field and gathering that information and yes. not being retaliated against. Right, correct. Um, I'm looking to see if there's other questions that folks have. As a reminder, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A. Um, we're getting some comments in the chat, which are great and lovely. And I appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, 
uh, about this this webinar and any questions that you'd like to ask, please put in the Q and A, um, and we'll get to those that we are able to. Um, let's see. Um, all right, I see a question for Lauren, who I think is there and able to to chime in right now. Um, yeah, can you hear yes. me? Yes, we can. Great, Lauren. Um, Great. One, if you can talk a little bit more about the role of post high school education in manufacturing, um, can can you talk at all about how your research um, examined that, or what we would look at research going forward to to delve into that question more? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that what my co-author, um, who focused primarily on that part of the research, her conclusion was, um, you know, we're not going to make America great again by bringing back, um, you know, a ton of manufacturing jobs for women without a college degree, uh, whether that's with a high school diploma or without. Those declines have just been so significant. Um but for women with a college diploma or with an advanced degree, manufacturing can, is growing rapidly and can be an excellent route for women not only to have a good paying job, but a good paying job with benefits um, that they would not be able to find elsewhere, particularly if they can um, be in a unionized role. So I think it's something to follow going forward. Um, this change is relatively recent. Um, but as manufacturing goes higher tech, I think following um, kind of those rates of education and manufacturing is going to be really, really interesting. Great. Thanks, Lauren. All right. I really appreciate um, everyone chiming in with your questions and thoughts, and especially for Lauren and Vera. Um, I do want to talk for just a moment um, from, I'll put on my policy hat. Um, I've, I've mentioned a few pieces of legislation that we support um, and there's more in the report, but I also wanna make sure that folks know how important it is to engage on these issues at the local, state and federal level. Obviously federal legislation covers um, a wider swath of workers, but we can really, really get a lot done at the state and local level as well, which we've seen, especially with pay equity laws over the last five years or so. So I encourage everyone to engage at their state and local level um, to pass legislation, to sort of move us forward. Um, we've seen really great advances. And I think in addition to providing coverage at the state or local level, it also propels movement and, and, and moves um, other states forward, which can help propel federal legislation and get a, get a real uh, tidal wave of progress going. Even just in 2019, we passed a pay equity bill in Alabama that I don't think would have been possible without broad engagement across the country. Um, and now Mississippi is the only state that doesn't have any sort of equity provisions on the books. And I think, you know, it's a really, it's a real red mark for them. Um, and they're working hard to try and change that. So we, we can see momentum just spread and ripple across the country. We're seeing that with, um, as I was talking about earlier, accommodations for pregnant workers um, and paid leave. More and more states are adding, adding paid leave protections. Um, so it, it's really exciting and momentous. Um, really, really important. And, and I think it's important both to have pieces that are tailored to specific industries when we identify specific problems, um, as well as overarching things to get at all employers. Um, as Kim has just dropped into the chat, you can access the full report thanks to the Arconic Foundation um, on our website. The link is there, but it should also be easy to find on the AUW website. Um, and I just want to pause at this point to thank, thank Ryan and Arconic uh, for this important um, funding for independent research. I want to thank Lauren for conducting the research. I want to thank Vera for all of her work and for giving us time today to speak with her. Um, and I'll pause for a moment if Kim has any final comments that she wants to add. Thanks, Kate. Vera, really, I just want to applaud you for your authenticity, your, your honesty, for your sharing of your story and your observations and your tremendous career and really being able to give us that 
that personal lens into manufacturing. You know, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and it was uh, definitely a big manufacturing town. Uh, it was pre-Amazon and pre a lot of the changes uh, that we have seen in the last uh, 20 to 40 years. And just knowing of the tremendous opportunities, and as we think about how our demography is changing, not just in our nation, but around the globe, there are tremendous opportunities that we want to make sure those industries and sectors where we're not seeing um, as many people of color and women in those roles, all that we can do to ensure that women's economic security for themselves and for their families um, is being provided to them in lenses, even if they've been traditionally gendered roles for men. And I think we have still a, a lot of work to be done, um, not just in the manufacturing field, but in, the, in sectors um, across industries. And I know that with our focus on fact-based research and with pragmatic uh, recommendations for change, we can continue to move down that conveyor belt towards change. But I just want to, again, express my thanks to Kate to Lauren, to Vera, and also a hearty thanks to Ryan Kish and the Arconic Foundation today.